Soil School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by The Mosaic Company. Welcome to Real Agriculture Soil School Series. I'm Kara Oosterhouse. I have here with me Steve LaRock, who is with Beyond Agronomy. How is it going today? I'm doing great, thanks. That's awesome. Okay, so we're standing in a field here and we're looking at controlled traffic farming. Do you wanna yes. tell me a bit about what that is? Controlled traffic farming. Well, really it's a, it's a farming system and it's a farming system that seeks to mitigate or eliminate or reduce at least the effects of compaction and slippage from heavy equipment. So really, it's really about driving in straight lines, matching your equipment widths and you're matching your axle width. So they all drive on permanent tram lines. So the field we're in right now, what, yeah. how many years has this been done? This is, this is the 13th year, 13th year in CTF, yeah. So what was the reasoning that you got involved with CTF and why you yeah. thought it was ah. important? Well, I had done a Nuffield scholarship back in 2008 and uh, I was looking at different precision agriculture technologies and I actually landed on CTF and I ended up in Australia and kind of learned about their droughts and floods, um, their boom bus cycle. And uh, we have boom bus, bus cycles, but not probably as frequent as them. So I thought, man, what, what would that system look like here in Western Canada? Would it really level out um, you know, the, the peaks and the valleys and really produce on years where you know, we, we do get low rainfall? So uh, that led me to take a, you know, a deeper dive into CTF and what it might mean here. And then in 2010, I mean, we don't farm a lot and I do a lot of testing more than anything. So I thought with a lot of different ideas, I just thought, let's just jump in. And uh, my, my in-laws are really crafty, like they're really skilled at uh, welding and fabrication. And so I just was able to modify our equipment to match, you know, uh, 10 foot centers. So our axle widths are 10 foot and our, uh, our widths are nine feet or 30 feet, nine meters. Um, so we have a 30 foot, 30 foot header on the combine the drill is only 30 feet and the, the sprayer is only 60 feet. So the multiples match. You can go to 120, uh, 120 foot booms if we wanted to. We could, we could move to 40 foot. Uh, some people are on 80 foot seed, like 80 foot seed hawks, 80 foot borgos, 160 foot uh, sprayers. So you can get pretty big with it. Uh, it, is about, it is about flow though, moving grain off combine. And that's kind of where the, the Achilles heel can be, not for everybody, depending on what your production levels are. So if you're really heavy production, you know, you're 100 plus bushel on barley, 120, 130, there's a lot of, lot of grain to move and you can't just go wherever you want. So you have to be real strategic. It's, it's possible, but it just takes a different level of management. So talk to me what this does to the actual soil structure yeah. and, and, and the makeup there. Yeah. So we, we often focus on, for the longest time, it was chemistry, right? It was the chemical nature of soil, NPKs, macros, micros, CC. Uh, pH. We're looking at those chemical aspects. Now we're moving into the biological aspects, which is great with regen and looking at soil health and biology. But we're still not talking about the physical side. And you can't change sand, silt, or clay, but you can actually change the porosity of your soil. You can change the the friability. You can change the structure of it so it can actually hold a lot more water and drain a lot more water so you're not flooding. So really, um, the premise and the what we're trying to accomplish is just increasing the porosity of the soil so it can drain and it basically it creates a whole bunch of condo space for biology to live. So if it's too compacted, which these clay soils can be, because this is a 70% a clay soil. And when I start digging, you'll, it'd be hard to imagine this is a 70% clay soil, um, but it is. So it really helps to open up that soil and build resilience. So when it's really wet, we still perform. And when it's really dry, we still perform. So talk to me about some of the numbers. You guys have done some testing in, yeah. in draining and what yeah. have you found there? Yeah, we were um, early days, so 2013, so we were, you know, three years into it. Uh, there were a number of farms and we formed a group called CTF Alberta. And we were doing randomized replicated kind of infiltration trials um, where we take, you know, infiltration rings and time them uh, on different spots in the wheel track between and on the wing. And we could drain an inch of water in about 21 seconds and we could drain up to six inches in the same spot, six inches of water in, a, I think it was a minute 26. So just over a minute, we could drain six inches of water and store that in the soil and move it away from the root zone so it wouldn't choke out. Things like what we have here is barley, barley and peas or even canola that don't like wet feet early, but they use a lot of moisture. So yeah, that, that, those trials were great. They, they opened our eyes to what could be 
because they were dra dramatically different than our controls. Our controls were like the minute to drain or more to drain that, uh, that inch of water, whereas we were like seconds. On the drier years, I can tell you our long-term uh, crop insurance averages, our long-term yields are, are well above average. And I, and I say that humbly, um, they, they are really good. This system performs year after year, regardless uh, whether it's been, because we've had really wets in there and really dries in there. And we're, yeah, we're tickled, so. So talk to me about, you know, compaction, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but 80% of compaction happens yeah. in the first the pass. The first pass, hey, nice one. So the, yeah. <laughs> so then, yeah. w like going over this year yeah. after year after yeah. year, is, th is there any problems there? Yeah, you know what, so we, uh, given our, wheel widths and our axle widths, we're giving up about 17%. This is the funny part. Like, so we're giving up 17% of our land base to wheel tracks, yet our area average or our average is a lot higher than, than the rest. So even though this little tram line that's like, is hard as a rock versus, versus beside it, right? It is hard as a rock, but the outside rows will actually, and we've done yield tests, like one meter a row, count the heads, weigh the kernels, that sort of thing. And, uh, and it'll actually yield almost 50% higher in these outside rows to make up for the additional light, the additional water. Yeah, so whenever you have a, let's say a, a plugged run, let's say, um, plugged run, let's say you fertilize, but you plug the run and there's no seed there. Well, those outside rows you'll see on either side of that skip will yield higher. They'll just produce more kernels. And that's what we saw, especially in barley, where we did the test on randomized replicated. And it was, you know, up to 156 bushel barley uh, equivalent on the outside of the trams. The uh, field average was, I think, 117. It was uh, AC Medcalf. So 117 bushel average, and it was like 150 something in those outside. So it was almost making out for the, for the two rows that are inside the trams, because we're missing basically two rows. So have you seen any difference yeah. between response with different types of crops or, or not so much? You know what, not so much. Um, I think what, we, what we've seen the biggest difference in would be uh, barley. Uh, because barley doesn't like wet feet and barley loves moisture. So we saw, we saw quickly in our CTF trials that, uh, that barley responded. It wasn't big early days. It was three years into CTF. I think it was maybe 8%, but an 8% yield advantage on a, on a hundred bushel or a hundred plus bushel crop is nothing to sniff at. Um, and then root architecture. That's one thing we've really seen. I won't show it today because I don't have any canola stubble left here, but, uh, the root architecture, like the, the roots you'll see, and I've got some photos and I've had some field days where I just kind of walk out into my canola crop and I pull out a plant. Normally they snap off, but we're pulling tap roots that are 14 inches, 15 inches. So just we're changing the architecture so they're able to explore more soil. And at the end of the day, that's what it's, that's what it's about. They're just exploring more soil, more nutrients. So they just build a little more resiliency.